Hi everyone. Uh, so today we have Tavisha Darmavarda visiting us from the Flatiron Institute. Tavisha did her PhD with Seska Kemper at Asia in Taiwan. Her thesis was on the uh, mass loss history, tracing the mass loss history of evolved stars using submillimeter data. Uh, after this, she uh, during this time she became involved with the nearby evolved star survey, of which we have quite a few members at India as well. And uh, she then moved to Max Planck Heidelberg, where she was a postdoctoral research fellow uh, working with the Gaia PTAC team under Karen Baylor Jones. She is currently at the Flatiron Institute. She's a Flatiron Fellow there. And uh, starting next year, she'll be a Hubble Fellow at NYU. Um, I, at the end of her talk, and also uh, the entire, she's here at the Institute the entire week. I sent an email out. She's very interested in talking to especially graduate students about. Uh, research opportunities at the Flatline Institute. So uh, she, she probably will advertise that a little bit during the talk. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, to okay, that's fine. Yeah, she's really happy to talk with graduate students. Yeah. So if you're interested, send me a message. Uh, there's enough graduate students we can have just a one hour session that everyone can ask Maybe questions cookie. about. <laughs> Sorry? Maybe cookie. <laughs> yeah, sure, why not? Why not? <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay. so she's gonna tell us today about her work on extinction maps using Gaia. Thank you for having me, Sundar. It's been really nice visiting Marnalia um, and Una. Uh, so a lot of the work I'm going to show is a lot of the stuff I did at NPA and now sort of continuing at Flatiron and at NYU the next year. Uh, so my talk is divided in... Ooh, okay. Click again and then... Yeah. Yep, okay. So it's divided into four sections. I'll sort of go up along the direction of why dust is important. I feel like I always have to convince people that dust is important because most of the time it's treated as a nuisance rather than its main, like the star of the show. Um, and then I'll sort of go on to mapping dust densities, the techniques we use, and then molecular clouds to the full Milky Way and some of the nice augmented reality things that we've been doing at MPAA. Okay, yeah, so Dust is only 1% of the total baryonic mass in the, in the universe, right? but it's involved in basically every process that's happening within the universe. So dust is formed in AGB um, and red supergiants. It's ejected out by planetary nebulae and supernovae. It's processed in the ISM. There's also discussion about dust being formed in the ISM as well. And then it's incorporated back to uh, within planets and stars in the star and planet formation process. So H2 is formed on dust molecular, on dust, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, dust cools down and coagulates for planet formation. So every process that's happening within a galaxy involves dust. So it's really important to understand properties and physics of dust and the structure of it within galaxies. Uh, I'll, I'll just stick to my thing. Yeah, so one of the ways that we have started mapping dust is the 2D extinction method, where we have light coming to us from a star. There's a dust cloud. Dust absorbs and scatters this and sort of diminishes some of the light coming to us. And we have a measurement of this, so it's called extinction. And this lets us then nicely map what the dust structure looks like in the Milky Way. So this was started very, very early on in 1998 by Schlegel, Fink, Banner, and Davis, who made this beautiful map. And we're already seeing the galactic plane in it very nicely. And, uh, and we know that dust is concentrated on the galactic plane. It's about a uh, scale height of about four to 600 parsecs. And then in the rest of the uh, Milky Way, you don't have a lot of dust. So the issue with extinction or doing things with 2D extinction is the fact that it's an integrated quantity, right? You're, so you have your dust column, you collapse it down. So everything that you're seeing is just this foreground integrated quantity. Anything behind this wall is completely lost. And this, is, this becomes an issue when we want to actually know what the structure of the Milky Way is, because we know we have a good understanding of what it looks like in 2D, but nothing about what does it look like in 3D. So that's sort of where uh, the motivation of why there's this new generation of 3D dust maps coming out. Uh, there's a lot of really nice maps being done by several different groups. And why we focus on dust density, like I said, is dust density as a quantity 
is the derivative of the integral. So it's the point information that we have along the line of sight. So that then lets us build these really beautiful maps into, in 2D and 3D. And we don't also want the 3D extinction because like I said, extinction is still an integrated quantity. So even if you have a 3D extinction, what you're doing is you're averaging out components essentially. So you're losing out the high resolution information. So really you do want the 3D density here. Um, and Gaia is basically what revolutionized this field because we now have information to 220 million sources-ish with extinction and parallaxes to a billion sources. So what we can do is then we have a distance to a star, we have its um, from the parallax, we have an extinction, we can then start looking at uh, sort of neighboring stars and start building what these clouds and the structure of the Milky Way looks like. Uh, 3D dust density mapping has a whole lot of challenges. It's not a simple process to do. Like I said, what we want is the dust density, but our observable is the extinction. So we basically have to go from this integral quantity to its derivative. And you can't just simply take an integrated quantity and just get a derivative out of it because of the way the structure forms. Because if you have an integrated quantity, think of it as like, if you have two plus two will make four for you, but so will one plus three, right? So you can't just go from the derivative down. And then um, another really annoying thing that we always have to deal with is this thing effect called the fingers of God effect in the Milky Way, where what happens is if you look down at a Milky Way map, top down, there are these streaks, very thin streaks sort of going away from us in a radial direction. They're very straight and very thin. So these are not real structures. What happens is our understanding of the RA and depth uncertainties are a lot more precise than the distance uncertainties. So what happens when you're mapping things is that you're sort of like your, your algorithm is essentially like, oh, this cloud could go here or maybe here. If I stretch it out a bit, maybe I could put it in this whole di like distance range. So you start seeing these really thin streaks. And there's a massive issue that a lot of people are trying to solve and it's still not fully solved and it won't be solved until we get precise parallaxes and distance uncertainties. And this is beyond Gaia here. Gaia currently, Gaia here might help us, but not, not even that. Um, and then of course, like I said, dust density is a physical quantity measure of what the density is in a cloud. So it has to be positive. So you have to have this constraint that extinction has to be monotonically non-decreasing. So your extinction can't go down. It can go flat, but it can't go down. And then of course, clouds are all varying shapes and sizes. So you need this sort of, you can't have a simple sort of structure assuming that a cloud is a spherical blob. Um, and, and we already see that when we look at 2D extinction maps, we see clouds, which are like, we see streaky shapes, we see sort of sheets and things. So you can't just assume that it's a spherical block. Um, and then when you try and solve all this, it's an extremely computationally expensive problem. So this is where a lot of the work that I did came in. So we wanted to solve all these problems and have an efficient way of solving all these problems. So that's where my um, code distribution comes in. And uh, distribution is a completely public uh, 3D Milky Way uh, mapping code. Right now it maps dust density and extinction, but it's a 3D mapping code. So if you have other parameters, feel free to play around with it. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, all the results go on the website up there and the code is available on GitHub. Uh, and it's built on a few different techniques. We, the primary thing is that it's built on a Gaussian process. And the, way, the reason why we use Gaussian process is to minimize the things of board effect. I'll go into that a bit um, in the next slides. And then we use things like variational inference and of course GPUs to really improve the runtime and speeds. And currently at its capability distribution is able with GPUs, it maps the whole Milky Way out of about three kiloparsecs, so the results I'll show in about a week at 1.7 plus resolution. So very quickly, um, I'm gonna go over some of the technical terms just so that we're all on the same page. Um, I won't go too much into the detail. We can talk about it after if you're interested. Uh, so a GP is essentially, it's a distribution of infinite set of functions that's described by a covariance matrix and hence a kernel. So what we do with this uh, GP is when you have data, you can basically constrain from this infinite set of functions to a specific function 
or a set of functions that you want. So that's sort of the power of GPs. In reality, it could really like be used to fit pretty much any structure in n dimension. So we use it in 3D, but you can really try pushing the limits for GPs. Um, and then where does the latent variable thought, thought come? So what, like I said, extinction has to be monotonically non-decreasing and hence dust density has to be positive. So what we do is the GP isn't applied on our observable parameter. What we do is we start our GP at log 10 density. So our GP predicts maps on the log 10 density plane. And what the, that means is that we can then go to density and at log 10, it'll never be negative. So we force a positivity constraint there. And then we, into, uh, we remove the log 10 and go to density. Then we, have a, we can integrate along every line of sight to which we have a Gaia star. And then we have our modeled extinction. Then we can basically do likelihood estimation using our observed parameters from our observed table. So that's essentially what a latent GP means. It's a layered process. So, um, and right now the way distribution is built is it's built on a very simple RBF kernel, so a Gaussian kernel in three dimensions. We allow the scale length in X, Y, Z to vary. We don't fix it. We have an initiating scale length and then it's allowed to vary to whatever it wants. And that is how we get all these structures sort of that are elongated, sheet-like, uh, filamentary structure and everything we can recover because we allow these parameters to vary. Uh, if, if it's fixed, most of the time what happens is you end up with a strike of block situation. You have to click again, so. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay, so variational inference is a very powerful technique, not just in GPs, you can use it in other techniques as well. Well, what you do is you have your exact posterior and you replace it with an approximate posterior, which is a Gaussian. So we can use, we use a Gaussian, which is described by a mean and standard deviation. So this means you can basically reduce the amount of points you have to fit. And then, of course, this is done with inducing points. So what we really do is instead of fitting this full GP points, we have inducing points and allow the GP to go through that. And what we do is we don't fix the inducing points. We allow the inducing points to be learned, the positions to be learned, so that it knows to go to where we expect structure to be. So onto more of the data side of what we do. Um, if all the work that I'll show, the results that I'll show uh, in the upcoming slides are done using the Foynier et al. catalog from 2022, which derives extinctions, distances, and a lot of other stellar parameters um, using Gaia DR2 to mass and wise. So it combines these to derive the extinction and distance parameters. And the reason why we use this catalog over DR3 right now is because it is an infrared combined catalog. We want the infrared because we want to be able to probe deeper into the molecular clouds because they're, they're dense enough that we need the infrared component to get in there. Um, and then, of course, another powerful thing about this catalog is that it doesn't assume a galactic prior. So there is no fixed shape to the galaxy at all. So it purely derives the galactic shape on its own. So we're not forcing things like spar alarms to show up or anything like that. And why don't you cross match with Gaia DR3? Why don't we? Yeah, I mean, you're using Gaia DR3. Yeah. So why not uh, the, the, the cells that you have there cross match them with Gaia DR3 and use Gaia DR3 there? Because it's not combined with infrared yet. Yeah. Because yeah, I don't to... understand that. Oh, because so, so the, when this SED is fitted for the stars, this is using both the Gaia DR2, so the BPRPG magnitudes. And then also the two mass and wise magnitudes. Whereas if we only use DR2, uh, DR3 will right, have only BPRP and um, G right now, because the current, uh, because within the DPAC, we're not allowed to use external data. We have to only use Gaia data. So I'll actually get to this towards the end. There will be a new reprocess catalog coming out, which will combine it with infrared. Um, yeah, so what we one of the first things we did was took distribution, it would work very nicely, and applied it to molecular clouds. There wasn't a very good reason why these 16 were picked. I liked them, so I decided to map them. Uh, is, is sort of the logic I went with. 
Um, yeah, so we have all the nearby clouds, things like Perseus Taurus, all the way out to like Cygnus and Perina. And uh, we had an initiating scale length of 10 parsecs there, and its grid resolution of the sampling is less than one parsec. So we achieved pass sub parsec resolution for these scales. And just from this map, you can already see that you have these things that are flat sheets, you have spherical blobs, you have filamentary structures, and everything in between. So these molecular clouds, when you look at it in 3D as well, they're very non uniform. So we didn't want to stop at just mapping the clouds. We wanted to derive parameters for these clouds because we have mapped the clouds. So now what? What do they look like in 3D? What are their parameters? So to do that, one of the first things we did is we separated out the clouds with astrodendro. So the mean that we so astrodendro is a density-based sort of uh, dendrogram structure which separates out your molecular structures. And the, uh, the mean density is what we used as a lowest contour. So we separated out the cloud from our background and then went further up into its densest clumps, essentially. And this allowed us to measure things like things like the uh, maximum and minimum in L, B, and D, and X, Y, and Z, obviously, I didn't put that in this table, but also things like volumes, uh, filling factors, masses for these structures. And what, and because we were able to actually get down to this 12% statistical error uncertainty in the dust masses. And this is, um, so it's 12% here because we're actually completely ignoring things like the, con uh, the conversion factors. So the dust to gas ratio factors and things that the optical uncertainties are removed because those are sort of fixed values that come from external sources. So within this itself, uh, within distribution derived dust masses, we get this 12% uncertainty. And when you just look at this table, the whole table, I didn't put all the sources here, you start seeing they're extremely varied. None of it is uniform. You don't have same masses. You don't have same extents. So it's very important to sort of understand that environments of these molecular clouds are very different. And when you start taking the third dimension, you can see this very clearly. So characterizing them uniformly is not something that can simply be done. And I think caution is required if you're trying to characterize these uniformly. Sorry, what's the meaning there of the feeling factor if the observations are actually resolved? Oh, so the so filling factor is basically what we do is we assume a spherical shape first, and then we have our real shape, and then we do the one divided by the other, basically. It was just the ratio of the two. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> did you do the math there? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so now we can go through some of my favorite clouds. So Orion has been studied in extreme detail, so there's a very good structure to, like, test all our um, algorithms with and see if we're recovering the nice structures. And we do. We have Orion A and B very nicely here. We have the Lambda Ori bubble. And this is a newly discovered filament that we had hints of already from Gaia VR2. Like you can see the elongated filamentary structure in 2D extinction. But now we actually recover it very nicely in 3D as well. So that's part of the Orion uh, molecular cloud. And another interesting thing with Orion is this gap here, because we have Orion A here and then Orion B here, and it sort of forms this cavity in the, like so that where it overlaps this whole um, where Orion A and B sort of overlaps. And this was interesting because we didn't know where this cavity comes from. So that's why I'm not calling it a bubble and I'm calling it a cavity because we looked for everything. We looked at everything from like supernova remnants or anything that could probably blow out a cavity, and there's nothing there. But it is sort of forming, oh, yeah, it is forming this sort of bubble shape here. Um, I was talking to some of the Radcliffe voice people about this a bit as well. And what they suggested is it's not even part of the Orion structure, it's part of the Radcliffe wave structure. So it's forming this bended shape essentially. So that's something that we're looking into now. So we've narrowed down what's happening here. Which one is A and B? Sorry. All right, yeah. So Orion A is here and B is here. So this is a top down view. And uh, if you look at it here, we have Orion B here and Orion A sort of standing in distance out here. Are those coordinates the galactic coordinates? Yeah, this is galactic coordinates in XY. And then another interesting thing you can do with Orion is actually compare it to California, because in 2009, Lada Cal suggested that Orion has this sort of tail and a bubble. So does California, tail and a bubble. 
And they thought the distances were similar, but we have better understanding on the distances now, and they're not that similar. Um, and they were like, but they look the same, but the star formation rates for these two clouds are very different. And they were like, okay, why is this happening? We can, they're sort of same size, same shapes, but they're very different. And that mystery is very easily solved as soon as you look at it top down. So this is California, and this is RNA. RNA is more sort of elongated triangular shape. California is more sheet shaped. And the next step to this is as soon as you measure the masses and the volumes, what happens is Orion or California is just so much bigger and so much, um, it's like, oh, it's two times larger in mass and seven times larger in volume. So it's just much bigger. And because of that, it's much lower density. Hence the star formation rate is lower. And whereas RNA is much smaller, much denser, higher star formation rate. So this is why we can't really like, now that we are in this era of 3D mapping, we can't assume things just using the 2D. You have to start taking this 3D uh, component into account as well. Um, same with Vila. This is another one of my very good, like favorite examples to share. We have Vila in this sort of nice boxy shape, A, B, C, and D. And, um, and this is in 2D extinction. But the story completely changes when you look at it in 3D. So this is the top down view again. We have Vila A here. C here and D here, B is completely missing. And hints of this was already seen in the gas dating, the velocity cubes, that like this could be much further out of Vila B. And you can we can confirm this with 3D dust density mapping. Because Vila B is nowhere here. So we, whereas Vila is sort of in the local arm region, if you believe it's far along, and uh, Vila, uh, Vila B is further out in Perseus sort of region. Yeah. What is the resolution of this table? So this is, uh, the resolution is, uh, I think Vila was about one parsec when we mapped it. So this is, uh, so it goes, yeah, so it's about 600 parsecs in distance. Top down, right? So the, the size of it, basically. What are the maximum densities that you can estimate? Oh, um, that's a good question. I don't have the number off the top of my head. I really should, because that's exactly the top of my color bar all the time, but I can't remember this right now. But uh, I will look it up and let you know. Um, yeah, so uh, another sort of thing that we were looking at is, okay, we have these varying shapes and sizes now. Can we compare it to the Lawson's relationship, which looks at the total mass? So what are the Lawson's relationship, of course? which looks at the total mass and spherical radius and says it's this linear relationship. And intuitively sort of when I was thinking about this, I expected the, this, not, this relationship not to hold when we're looking at the varying structures. Because if you're looking at like all these elongated shapes, I didn't expect this linear relationship to hold. But if you look at it in X extent, it's the same with Y and Z, I'm only showing the X, the linear relationship really just holds which is something I'm not fully sure why it's happening. And this is something I'm hoping someone like, I think Javier, you had some good ideas about that. I would love to talk to you. Um, yeah, but I, I think like that was a bit of a, oh, that's strange sort of thing when we plotted these two together. Um, yeah, uh, and this was another very interesting result that we got. So this is sort of going back to the 2D extinction, essentially. When we look at it from the 2D extinction, we have, so what, with 2D extinction, that's a very good proxy for the dust opacity in optical. And with Planck, we have the long wavelength information. So we have, it's a very good proxy then for the opacity in sublimator. So when you look at this ratio, we see this very, so the numbers are not that important. What's important is that this diffuse region has a much more different ratio to the dense molecular cloud regions. So we think something related to variations in grain sizes or grain shapes are happening here. This is again, ongoing work that we're trying to figure out, okay, why is this happening? Uh, did, did you also uh, went, went uh, all the way to calibrate the submillimeter opacities? Or, or, or... No, no, this was very simply to keep our extinction we put them back. And this was like very preliminary work, but we just ended up like, oh, okay, this is interesting. We should really start digging into this a bit more. Um, and then 
this plot is sort of uh, so here what we have is total mass and the molecular cloud and in red we have the integrated dust extinction so this is you have a cube collapse it down and then you measure your dust uh, masses right then in blue what you have oh, in blue what you have is the dust sink dust sink dust cube you take it you separate out your dust component your molecular cloud component with astrogender in 3d then you measure the dust mass so what we're seeing is this massive difference between the two measurements, right? It's almost a magnitude off, especially in the larger clouds like Cygnus. And this is another thing of like, each measurement of the dust density isn't wrong, but you need to be aware of what you're measuring because in 2D, what you're doing is you're taking in the cube, you're taking all the surrounding mass, as well as the background mass, and you're collapsing all that down to measure the mass. So you are really overestimating what could be the cloud. So this has then effects on star formation um, and a lot of other implications in that field. So it's sort of it's important to be aware of it. Yeah, and then this is the latest work that we've been doing, mapping the full Milky Way out to uh, three kiloparsecs. It's actually two point eight. Um, Mostly because that's the amount of patients I had. I just wanted to stop at 2.8. Um, and even with distribution, with its speed, with its runtime and its memory improvements, it still can't map this whole thing in one go. So what we do is we split it into components of LBD. And then we do a lot of overlapping chunks and then weighted media, do a weighted media combination of this. So that's how we end up with this full map. And this smooth edge at the end is simply because we're losing out on information at the end. So the GP just flattens out to the mean. What's the circular print artifacts, I guess? This ring here? Yeah. Yeah, that is an artifact of the merging, basically, because this isn't basically the weighted uh, medium can't compress it down. But this is like, it's, we're very good at picking this up with the eye, but when you look at these in radial profiles, you can't see this effect at all. So it's just like an unfortunate blip in the nice plots that we have. Um, yeah, so when you start looking at this, you can very nicely start picking up things like the Cygnus molecular clouds, and in the nearby we have the Taurus and Perseus clouds, Vela, um, and all the clouds towards the galactic center. And then if we start looking at sort of at a larger scale, a few hundred parsec scales, we have the Radcliffe wave split and the Sagittarius spur. Oh, I actually forgot to mention that these are 2D extinctions along Z. So what we do is we have our XYZ cube, we collapse it down so that we have the top down view in extinction. And then if you look at this in density, so this is we have a, a XYZ cube, we take the Z equals zero slice. And this is very good in picking up all these under densities, so cavities essentially. So this is what we think is like an interama in the spur region. And we have the Vila super bubble, the local cloud here, the local bubble here. Um, this is the Camilla Pedalus Gulf. So with this technique, not only are we able to recover the dense molecular clouds and larger scale structures, we are able to recover the under dense things like the cavities and bubbles as well, which is important when you're mapping the flow Milky Way. Um, yeah, so maybe this is actually something I could use help for uh, the group here, because so one of the interesting things we found is, so all these blue dots are confirmed YSL mazes from Reed, uh, Reed et al. 2018. And so most of these mazes fall very nicely in the molecular cloud regions where we expect YSOs to be formed in the dusty regions. But then this specific set of YSOs outline this cavity very nicely. So they're not in the dust, they're on the edges of the dust outlining a cavity. And one of the theories we have is there's a very large supercluster here uh, that might be sort of blowing out gas uh, sort of winds and then causing shock waves at these edges, uh, allowing Y cells to form. But that's just a theory, but maybe if someone else has an idea, we'd love to actually know why this is going on. Yeah. 
So we also wanted to compare it to existing 3D dust maps. So we sort of think contours are all dust density maps. And then the green out here is the Bergelli 2022 map that came out recently. Um, oh, and the pink contour is actually at the 005 magnitudes of the classic scale. So that sort of probably answers your question. Um, yeah. And this is the integrated extinction map from our 3D cube. And we can see very nicely that we recover all the molecular cloud structures very nicely. The galactic planes recovered. And then towards the galactic edges, we see um, we don't have a lot of dust. So we recovered the full extinction scale as well. Um, so I'm sort of coming towards the end of my talk now. Uh, so we have all these very nice maps. So this was a lot of fun doing. So I'll start off with the distribution website. Uh, you can essentially, uh, you, oh, let me skip here, yeah. So you can basically get lines of sight, extinctions and densities. You have molecular cloud cubes here that we've mapped and you can view them, you can download them if you want. Um, they're in the extinction cube as well as the density cube. Um, yeah, and we have some of these augmented reality posters that we did, and of course, you can download your, the cubes. Right now, we don't actually. Oh. Yeah. Right now, we don't actually have the full Milky Way uh, cubes in this website, but that's because I haven't had time to do that. If you want the cubes, I'm happy to pass them along. So just ask them, ask me for it. Um, and another thing that we did was for this outreach project at MPAA um, with Thomas Muller at the House of Astronomy. Uh, so that's, I don't know if you visited MPAA ever, but there's this like sort of galaxy shaped spiral building. And that's where the outreach department is held. Um, and what we did is, so, the, so you can scan this QR code and then it will take you to a website, which will then let you scan these QR codes and you can um, view the 3D structures on your phones and you can play around with them, rotate them, do what you want with them, essentially. It's, it's a really fun thing to do. I wouldn't recommend doing it right now because I don't think it works very well on the screen. Um, and another thing we're doing is augmented reality. So you can basically use these glasses and you can walk through the Milky Way. So this, is, this was amazing. So you have these cloud structures, you put it into augmented reality, and then you can just walk through them. Um, I wish I could have actually done a physical demo, they didn't let me bring the glasses over, so that was an issue. <laughs> uh, and of course, this was a really nice thing that we did as well, which you project the clouds onto the planetarium dome. And what really got me with this is the sheer size of the clouds, I think. And you don't expect them to sort of like, because Cygnus is the largest, so that's the one showing up here, but it's very small when you look at it on sky actually. And then, but then things like uh, you have Perseus and stuff, which are a lot more nearby. So they end up looking much larger on sky. This looks so much better with like music and on the planetarium <laughs> notes. So I'm not even gonna bother playing the whole video. Um, yeah, so where are we taking this now? Like I said, uh, there will be a reprocess catalog coming up, coming out from the CUA team, which will combine DR3 and infrared. And then, uh, of course, SPSS5 is something we're really looking forward to. It will have a lot of good spectral information, hence be able to derive better extinction parameters. Gaia DR4 in 2025 ish, um, which will basically release. So there's a requirement for the Gaia DPAC where you release everything. So you'll have the time. Uh, so the epoch information essentially for every single source, including not just the photometry, the spectral epoch information. So start planning now itself because it's going to be a massive, massive data dump essentially. Um, and then of course we have the RBS. Oh, yeah, we have the RBS and X XP spectra, which are proving to be a lot more than what we expected. You can really separate out stellar and ISM components from them, and even the BPRP spectra. And uh, so you can do a lot of these studies with these spectra as well already. Um, and like I mentioned, distribution is currently limited to an RBF kernel. We want to actually be able to recover all the scales simultaneously. So we want to sort of replace that with the spectral mixture kernel. 
Um, and like it, and also it's a 3D mapping tool. It's not a 3D dust density mapping tool. So if you want to try Gibbs, RV, dust gas, the, the capabilities for it are sort of, there's a wide range of capabilities. And of course, going over to the LMC and SMC, especially with DR4, we'll get better improved distances. So trying to iteratively improve and be able to map that in 3D as well. Um, yeah, so I'll actually leave my summary. I'll not go through it, but take any questions. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Before we go to questions, I just wanted to announce that we will be taking the speaker lunch. Uh, we'll be uh, out there at 1.50 p.m. So uh, students, especially if they're interested, join us. It's a free lunch. Um, and yeah, I'll just want to join. All right. Yeah. Bring uh, your own part. Yeah. Bring your own part. Uh, so, yes, let's see some hands for uh, questions. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. So, um, have you today tested the model with meta simulations of a piece of galaxy go to start in the We actually haven't. We tested it on our own sort of simulations. We basically made blobby structures and tested it, and that's how we knew the code was working. But one of our goals, especially when we start putting spectral mixture kernels in, is to take the Oracle simulations and try and map those. Because that would be very crucial because blobs won't cut it for um, when we have all the multi-scale structure. Questions are variable stars a problem. Yeah. We actually don't bother with variable stars essentially because for us, we so with uh the Sonia catalog, all I do is I literally just take the catalog as is. We validated it, we were happy with it, and then we just take it. So we don't really bother too much with the variable stars. And actually, I think the Sonia catalog throws a lot of them out already. Haven't you looked at the uh, the volume density PDFs? Of the other No, no, I haven't actually. Yeah. Because most of the stuff that I've been doing is mapping rather mm -hmm. than digging deep into the clouds. But I mean, if you're interested in doing that, I'm happy to pass everything along <laughs> or a student or someone. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, so I was so when you create your your grid over which you put the, the volume densities, I do you have like a like a uniform size grid or 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 do you select the size of the cells based on the error? I, I guess each cell will have a different error based on the stellar based on the based on the stellar density. Yeah, the yeah. The, you're you're very yeah. So the stellar density is start reducing as you go further out. Right. But we don't do that right now because with the RBF kernel, it correlates every single point in space so we don't really need to start doing that too much but again when you start swapping to so changing it to a spectrum extra kernel is when things really start becoming complicated because then you do want to start accounting for the the sort of the sparseness of the um now that then you sort of you need an adaptive grid but right, right now it's not an adaptive grid let's take a question from zoom enrique has a question. yeah enrique has a question uh hi uh, hi, Tavisha. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Uh, I'm. I have a, actually a comment on on your mystery between California and the Orion cloud, and uh, it, it, you may be familiar with our model for uh, molecular cloud evolution, and basically our interpretation of the different star formation activities of those two clouds is essentially one of age, so that um, California is expected to be, a, according to our model, a younger cloud, uh, but more massive in total than Orion. So uh, if you give it a few million years more, it might become as active or even more than, than Orion. So we actually have a paper from 2018 uh, in which we compare a number of several clouds in the, in the solar neighborhood, and actually both are there. And so uh, I might, um, you know, we might talk about that um, later on, or I can send you that uh, over email because uh, it, that's precisely the idea that the clouds are getting denser and more massive over time. And that Orion may be just like a, a at a more advanced evolutionary stage than California, both being 
having the same order of magnitude. So in other words, we need to take into account the temporal dimension as well. Yeah, what absolutely. Is. Yeah, I think it's important that, yeah, we do do this in static. So we only have a single static view of what it looks like right now. So yeah, yeah. Um, I can imagine this with the time information put in that California can evolve into a much denser cloud. Exactly. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Yeah. yeah, sure. We have lots of time for questions. Sir. Any <laughs> any questions for students? Any burning thing that you want? I don't stir my thoughts actually. Yeah. I should have more slides. Can you tell us about the uh, bad distribution opportunities. Oh yeah, I guess. Um, if there's any questions, we can come back to it. But uh, so. The Flatline Institute itself has this pre doc program, which is great. It's like you uh, apply to the Flatline, you have to work. If you, if you have a master's, you can apply in your first or second year of PhD. If you don't have a master's and you go straight into your PhD from your undergrad, then you have to be around your third year of PhD essentially to apply. Um, and the way it works is you, uh, you and your supervisor contact someone at the Flatline and you both build a project together. And the idea is that it's kind of, it's close enough to your thesis that you can, you understand the work, but it's different uh, so that you, you get a broader range of knowledge and you apply, you come there for six months, everything is fully paid and uh, you spend working with the researchers and, the, um, and I don't think you can actually include it as a thesis chapter, it is purely external project work that you can do. Where is the flat iron Institute? Oh, that's a good, yes. <laughs> okay, so the Flatland Institute is, as misleadingly as its name is not in the Flatiron building. It is next to the Flatiron building in Manhattan. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's lovely there, uh, very metropolitan. So yeah, look up New York before you come, I think, and be prepared. Uh, yeah, and NYU also has its summer, summer student programs. Um, that's a three month program. You can apply for it. And um, yeah, well, with supervisors, they just uh, they have projects going. Is that for masters or PhD students? That is for undergrad mas and masters. And I think PhDs as well, actually. I haven't heard much about that. Um, yeah, uh, and another program is, uh, so that's part of the Hubble Fellowship, so purely run by Hubble Fellows, where um, it's, it's to improve diversity and uh, in the Hubble Fellowship uh, uh, awardees, essentially. So the idea is you pair a Hubble Fellow with uh, either a uh, PhD student or a postdoc who wants to apply for prize fellowships in the US over a year and you work on your application, you work on your research projects. Um, so sort of like an external career mentor sort of thing. Uh, again, you apply. Unfortunately, the applications for this year just closed uh, about a month ago, but next year's ones will be opened again. So you can apply for that as well if you're interested in you know traveling to the US for solutions. Uh, and I'm here the whole week. So if you want to talk about it more in more detail, I'm very happy to do that. So if I can ask a question, you mentioned something about the Larson relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, what so I'm not familiar with all those, but what is, what are the assumptions? What does that entail? And it rises linearly. Could you go back to the yeah. Slides, like, yeah. refresh my memory? So I need to have a massive disclaimer here that I am not a Larson's relationship expert. I'm not a star formation expert. Maybe Let's start off with that. Mass. Okay. And you're yeah. saying that this should be a linear relationship? This, according to the Larson's law, is straight. It's very nice linear relationship. Okay. So when you assume a spherical radius. Okay. So, so uh, blocky uh, cloud. If you have a spherical cloud, we look at the density is constant. The mass should go R cubed. Exactly. Basically. But this one isn't. This is R. Where? You're saying what's a linear relation? A power law, log scale. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, the the last relation shows a power law between the mass and the size and the linear size uh, as r, r to the two. R to the two. Power. Yeah. Okay. But, but but that's based on column density measurements. Okay. And she's using the volume density. She's getting r to the three. So if you, if yeah. you pick, if you plot uh, an r to the three, there, this is this is the slope yeah. of that. Yeah. Exactly. But then okay, you also mentioned there is some, uh, you are achieving the relationship even though your fundamental uh, structures are not spherical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but this assumes a spherical cloud. And you what are you to, so when you plot a dot on this on this plot, mm -hmm. you're looking at the total mass of this 
large filament or how are you looking at some small region of that? No, so this is a total. So um so basically the colors are separations on astrodendro essentially. So all the little structures that we get is a blob here. The large scale structures are also a blob here. So we basically plot all the structures that we pick out. Regardless, there's, there's yeah, regardless of whether they're, we don't separate out sheets from filaments from blobs, essentially. Everything is just plotted So here. even the assumption behind Larson model is violated, it still continues to be. It still continues to be, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was the like, oh, sort of moment that we had when we made this plot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh. but did you tell uh, Charila this is the last one? He will tell you, tell you, tell you that it's not. It's not. It's not up to the two. Oh, okay, right, okay. <laughs> so it's very strictly R to the two. It doesn't have to be a linear. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And the spherical radius just means you take the total volume and convert it to yeah. a if we it just, was, yeah. yeah, we just may assume. And, and basically the reason for for the for the change of slope, depending on whether you measure one, the other thing. Is that most of the mass is in the lowest contour when you mm -hmm. your astrodendro. So uh, by much that that that's that why I was asking you about the PDF. Yeah. If the PDF decays rapidly, then you take a, a threshold in, in volume or in then in column density, and then the mean density will be right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I that's actually, what that, that you mentioned this. I actually did start doing PDFs uh okay. So I would like to show you some of those PDFs and maybe we could like go over that. That would be helpful. Yeah. I think there was a hand raised. Uh, yes. Uh, Enrique, did you have a comment? Well, yeah, it was about the same uh, point that Javier and, uh, and Tavisha are, are commenting about. And yeah, it, probably you can do that uh, even with the column density PDF, no, Javier? Uh, I mean, it doesn't really have to be the volume density PDF as long as you have a PDF and it drops quickly enough to high densities, uh, you may infer the same thing, for example. Yes, so, yes, but the top of the last relation changes from two to three. Uh huh. Yeah, that that should depend on 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 the actual density profile, mean density profile of the cloud. That 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 only depends on the profile of the PDF. If it falls rapidly, then you get the that will affect volume and not to have to Oh, you mean if it, if it drops off really quickly? Yeah, well, this is something that uh, I'll be interested in, in joining you also for discussion. <laughs> so. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Uh -huh. Very good. Maybe it's up. You have a question? Yes. Now I was thinking about this 3D matrix that now we have yeah, the, the set of components. Do you expect any dependence in shape and size of these mm -hmm. clouds with respect to the galaxy center? Mm -hmm. Maybe they are more compact towards the center or they are lagging in The short answer is no. We, they, for one thing, we don't get anywhere near the galactic center, right? We only map three kiloparsecs from the sun. So if we, uh, yeah, if you just look at this, the galactic center is in this direction and we stop at 2.8. Uh, and, and another thing I didn't really mention, but what sort of keeping in mind is a lot of these 3D maps is that uh, we are data limited, right? So we can basically see as much as Gaia sees. So we expect towards the galactic center to, for there to be a lot more dust, but it's so dense, we don't pick, the, pick it up. So it's not that there's no dust, there's, if there's too much dust that we can't pick up. So this is another limitation that all these 3D dust mapping techniques have. And again, we have to sort of wait um, either for Gaia near or if it gets approved, um, or things like the BBV surveys actually sort of try like having a really good um, influence here. I think let, to let to get towards the galactic center. Comments, questions. If not, let's thank Ravisha again. <laughs>